No, yeah. So I'll be talking about Bitcoin and blockchain. Can we do a quick show of hands of how many people here know about or uh, at least have heard about Bitcoin? Okay, quite a few. So it's a payment conference. So yeah, that's good. Uh, so uh, to start with, uh, let's go. What is Bitcoin? That's the first question everyone asks most of the places. Uh, Bitcoin is basically a new currency. It's an independent currency. It's completely digital and it is 100% guaranteed by pure means of cryptography and other security uh, features and code basically it's guaranteed by math nothing else uh, it was invented uh, uh, the paper initially was published in 2008 by an anonymous figure named satoshi nakamoto and uh, after that a lot of people began to review his code and ac the code was actually published uh, on open source platform in 2009 and ever since then it's been like uh, growing so satoshi nakamoto was an anonymous person uh, till date his identity is not known uh, although the technology in itself, a lot of well-known developers and key people in the industry are uh, contributing to this uh, Bitcoin technology. Uh, Bitcoin basically lets you send money over the internet. That is what it is in true essence. It's a digital currency and every digital currency or uh, be it any kind of asset, it basically uh, has to, uh, the value comes when it is able to transfer from point A to point B. So that is how it works. Uh, it's like you have an email address where you have a sender's address and a recipient address. You basically send information via email. Similarly, in a Bitcoin uh, world, what happens is you have a Bitcoin address uh, for the sender and receiver both. And the sender basically sends uh, uh, Bitcoins from one address to the another address. Uh, it is a limited uh, currency, like I said, the, the supply is limited. It's similar to, exactly similar to gold. Gold is also the, when uh, gold was created initially when the earth was formed, it was limited and the Bitcoin as well, the protocol has been set such that only 21 million Bitcoins can ever be in existence, out of which already 16 million Bitcoins have already been mined by a lot of computational uh, resources that are being put into the network. And uh, how do you get uh, Bitcoin and gold? It's a pretty much similar concept. Uh, you basically, if you want to get gold, either you mine it or you buy it from an exchange or there is jewelries or yeah, you kind of like, uh, uh, give some services to others and in exchange you get paid in gold or similarly Bitcoin. Uh, in terms of uh, where Bitcoin is being used, uh, the first transaction uh, that happened was way back in uh, 2009 and that was like seven or eight years ago and two pizzas were bought for 10,000 Bitcoins which was worth nothing at that point but in today's worth it's roughly about 10 million US dollars uh, close to about 70 crore INR. Uh, Tesla was also bought with Bitcoin recently. Uh, now, if you, you will always ask this question, where exactly is Bitcoin and why exactly do you need it? You might think you don't really need Bitcoin, but that is only until the point you actually do a, a international transaction or encounter any kind of international transaction. So if you have ever uh, done any international transactions or try to understand why these transfers take time, or if you have ever tried to use a credit card or debit card for an international transaction, or let's say you went for a foreign trip and returned back, you just have a little bit of change and banks refuse to take coins or smaller denominations in exchange for INR. So you're left with a lot of uh, foreign currencies and you basically can't exchange them as well. So that's another problem. And hyperinflation, Zimbabwe is the best example. You have uh, $100 trillion notes being used as one rupee and two rupee coins uh, there, over there. And uh, yeah. So also in places where there's a lot of unbanked population, Bitcoin also is very useful in those scenarios. Uh, yeah, perhaps when your country basically depending on the different where places where people transact in international uh, current, uh, requirement for international remittances or unbanked population, this basically is Bitcoin potential market index. And you can see that there are a lot of countries uh, who are already like uh, having a high uh, potential for Bitcoin. And uh, Bitcoin is definitely going to help uh, a lot of people in the world. If not here, maybe someone else or someone uh, who is yet to like uh, discover something out of it. And Bitcoin honestly is just not about payments. The underlying technology beneath it is a lot more than just uh, payments or transferring money from here to there. And that is where uh, blockchain comes into picture. Now the question is, what is blockchain? I just talked about, I just spoke about what Bitcoin is. Now, if you ask me about blockchain, blockchain in true essence is basically a ledger. It's a distributed decentralized ledger. 
what it does is it stores records of every transaction that happens. It might be information, uh, and also when it happened and who made it. So it is a, it is a permanent record, an immutable record. It cannot be erased. It cannot be tampered. Uh, now, what is the difference? Uh, Bitcoin basically is a way to transfer digital money from one place to another. It's a transfer of assets or ownership of digital assets. Uh, and blockchain, in true essence, is a database that records ownership with a time-stamped uh, continuous uh, database. Uh, you can see that here's a database, and it basically has some records. And every database has a uh, some kind of access control. Who accesses the database? There's a limitation to it. Uh, now imagine all of these databases in the world which are connected to each other. There is Google, there is Yahoo, and so many data centers which are connected to each other. As long as all the databases are in sync with each other, you know that if some value is being or some data is being uh, moved from here to there, the exact copy is also the database reflects that uh, the copy is also moved in other places as well, within the network or outside the network. And let's say one of this uh, network fails, the other networks can also be affected. But in a Bitcoin or blockchain driven scenario, it is not the case. If one of the uh, servers or the data centers is compromised, uh, the underlying uh, data in itself is never compromised. Only uh, the infrastructure would get, in terms of security as such, would get a bit compromised. But the actual user data is never uh, destroyed. And you have access control, like an uh, individual can have a single key, or an uh, individual can assign multiple keys to different parties and ensure that different people are given access based on their uh, uh, requirements uh, on the blockchain network. It's pretty much similar to a database. And all of these ingredients, one is the decentralized nature, the second is the cryptographic security that it uh, in the underneath implies, and also uh, the immutable time stamping. So it's like one, two, three, four. Every record goes in a continuous uh, time. So all of this form the perfect ingredients to what is called the blockchain technology. Uh, it's a, again the same points. This is the same thing again. Uh, transactions are synchronized through the network. So every time a transaction happens, it's always synchronized with the whole network. So what it means is, if you are connected to the blockchain network or the Bitcoin network, uh, either of which is actually the same. Uh, the transactions happening in one place will always be synchronized with the transactions happening in other part of the world. And a new block is created every 10 minutes. It's basically like every 10 minutes a sector is added to the database. And this sector is 100% validated by all of the other uh, nodes in the Bitcoin or the blockchain network. And here you can see that So basically, uh, what was there was the first transaction that ever happened in blockchain's world uh, was on 3rd January uh, uh, 2009. And we are almost uh, eight years from that point. And the first transaction in Bitcoin network happened in the same month, Jan of this, like uh, month, Jan 3rd. And also, uh, another thing is, uh, as in when the transactions are added, in real time, you can actually see what happened. Hmm. Yeah. Could you, uh, hi, Manu hi. again. Could you quick uh, sh expand on that sync times are synchronized across the network on the blockchain? Like how would one computer sort of, if there's a transaction, if there's two different transactions, what's with the time synchronization? How does that work? Uh, in terms of a database, it can be like UTC. It's basically based on UTC or epoch time as such. What happens is when you add, uh, let's say there are two databases, and when they are connected to the internet, right? Every uh, file that you add is always uh, time stamped on a UTC-based uh, time formatting. So when you upload something to one database here, 
it basically means on the whole network in terms of a uh, peer to peer network let's say for example bittorrent or a similar network when you are uploading a file from here or sharing a file at any place in the world the same file is retrieved or received at the other sides as well and it gets added to the file so in that way what happens is uh, a timestamp is maintained and it is synchronized so that is what i meant to say does that answer question No, you don't need GPS. It's like the computer or uh, protocols. That is uh, based on the uh, ledger. So, in the ledger, basically, what happens is every time a transaction happens, it leaves a chain behind. So, every previous transaction, I will explain that in the next slides. I mean, like every previous transaction is always linked with the uh, uh, previous transaction to that. So, when a current transaction is being added. it always has a bit of information of the previous transaction so it leaves a chain that way you are able to know if this transactions the set of transactions happened before it or after it is there like it's not one more mm -hmm. okay then does anyone else have questions yeah, in the meantime yeah but any windows or any, anything works if you can just give me a if you have a pen Yeah. Uh, hi, Suganda this side. Oh, yeah, tell me. Yeah, so you told that there is a lot of potential of using Bitcoin for the unbanked population. Yeah. So can you please elaborate on some use cases or organization which are making use of it? Uh, to start with, there is an organization called Bitgive. It is a charity uh, NGO kind of organization uh, for people from Brazil and other parts of the world where banking is not yet um, made feasible. So these guys basically go to every individual uh, and they just give them a Bitcoin wallet. A uh, wallet can be of different types. It can just be a software application that is installed in your mobile phone. or it can also be just your mobile number which can uh, be linked with some service provider like uh, there's this thing called bitpesa bitpesa is a mobile based bitcoin wallet uh, provider which runs on sms based technology internally what they do is they create a bitcoin uh, wallet for every user with a mobile phone and uh, they basically create wallets so it's a mobile based wallet solution uh, the beauty of this is unlike other uh, wallets or uh, 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 digital payment modes which are already existing in the market uh, with bitcoin it's a instantaneous setup so it's seamless you can like get started right away it can work on mobile uh, to a uh, non mobile kind of a situation as well it can even work on phone calls so you just give your uh, call up a number and dial your uh, pin it depends on the service provider so all of this can be made possible uh, but the service provider in the back end the technology which is being used uh, is compatible with every other uh, payment mode uh, because it is all digital it's uh, just uh, apis and a digital currency you can seamlessly uh, transfer uh, bitcoins from one part of the world to another part of the world it gives rise to global payments uh, scenarios is there anything being done in india in this uh not as of now but uh, there are a lot of companies which are actually uh, looking at blockchain to kind of like get started with the uh, rural and unbank get the unbank population on board and basically it's not just uh, dependent on any uh, organization or uh, company as such individuals can just get started right away so all you would require is a mobile app and you instantly have access to a new kind of a payment mode which is global as well as digital and it is compatible with every other uh, digital currency out there in the market that seamless Uh, compatibility can be achieved with bitcoin uh, yeah that's not i just to change it manually no problem that's not working as well can you just click uh, something mm. this is thing okay Thank you. 
Hi, uh, I'm Ashwat from yeah. uh, Sigital. Uh, so what does Coin Secure do? Do you use Bitcoin technology to do uh, secure transaction uh, transfer? Uh, we are basically, uh, at Coin Secure, we are a Bitcoin exchange in India. We enable Indian users to get on board this uh, technology. Like I said, the mining process, different ways of acquiring Bitcoin. Now, if you look at gold, gold is a digital, I mean, gold is a physical asset. You go to a, a gold shop or you go to a, a gold mining company and gold reserve basically and you get your gold bars from there. Uh, now with Bitcoin, uh, as long as there is Bitcoin being mined and people are generating these Bitcoins, there is always a requirement to sell these Bitcoins and eventually uh, get the uh, profits out or the mining cost or equipment as such. People actually sell it and uh, or there are traders as well who just do trading for arbitrage and try to get a uh, lot of uh, profits because of the market uh, speculations that go around in Bitcoin. So we are basically an exchange. We enable uh, users to buy and sell. We are a real-time open exchange. The beauty is uh, we are uh, completely open. All our order books are transparent. People can view the real exchange in real time. Uh, orders are placed. You are free to choose your own rates. And also uh, we allow users to see the entire history of uh, transactions that happened on our exchange. So it basically means uh, you can basically study the market, the way the prices are moving, and uh, basically profit uh, from it. So uh, it's a fair model. So say if I have some money in my bank, how do I set up Coin Secure? How do I set up a, a wallet on Coin Secure, or how do I set up my account on Coin Secure? Uh, you basically go sign up on Coin Secure, submit your KYC. KYC is a mandatory uh, norm that everyone has to follow. So we are fully KYC compliant company. So you basically go sign up. Uh, submit your KYC documents. Once the verification is done from the compliance team, you immediately do an NMP uh, regular uh, banking transfer to our uh, accounts and we kind of like update your balances and with that you basically can just go and uh, put a buy order or a sell order if you already have bitcoins and uh, depends on the use case. Uh, and you can just instantly buy bitcoins and because we are a real-time exchange, completely automated, uh, as soon as you buy your bitcoins, you can withdraw it the next second. So that is the beauty of uh, the Bitcoin technology in itself. Bitcoin in itself was made to enable uh, real-time fast payments. So that is uh, about it. it like. Hi. Yeah. Thank I'm you. Sharif from Paymatrix. Yeah. Uh, so how is the Bitcoin rate uh, exchange determined? A Bitcoin rate? The exchange rates, right? Huh? So how is it determined? Uh, it's a demand supply model, similar to uh, gold or any other uh, commodity or digital as a uh, uh, good, right? It's based on a demand supply model. If there is a huge demand, the prices are uh, based on the demand and also the supply. If the supply is there is a shortage of uh, supply, prices go up. And uh, because uh, Bitcoin in itself, like for example, gold in itself has an inherent uh, value because it's a shiny metal and a lot of other parameters, uh, Bitcoin has its value from its technology. It's security and the underlying technology that ensures uh, this, that is where the value for Bitcoin comes from. And Bitcoin's value uh, from a technology's pers uh, perspective or a tech guy from the tech background, I would say its value basically lies in the security and the way it simplifies the infrastructure. So the technology in itself brings a lot of value and its value is uh, pretty much it is priceless. Uh, going back to the presentation, uh, yeah, every 10 minutes, That's like I said, every 10 minutes a block is created. Uh, in terms of security, again coming back to that, where the value comes, uh, how do we ensure that uh, the transactions are basically uh, safely recorded? Uh, the main problem, the biggest problem here is organizations are centralized and uh, companies like JP Morgan or even other companies, when the databases get hacked or uh, entities get uh, compromised by internal or external parties, depends on the situation, varies from a lot of things. Uh, this is the main reason uh, such uh, things happen. And with money, it becomes a huge uh, risk. And it's expensive to secure. And you need to trust a single person who is in charge of one particular uh, department or wing within the organization. So things can go wrong within the organization and people can go corrupt. Uh, the solution basically is a decentralized network where uh, all of the computers in the world are connected to it and the databases are continuously, every transaction that happens on the Bitcoin net or the blockchain network can be viewed or audited by anyone in the world. So that's a decentralized network. Uh, it, it brings down the cost of security and also there's a 
fixed uh, set of rules. It's only math that you need to trust, not a single individual. So basically, nobody can actually run away with your money or decide, ki, I just want to wipe your accounts and take your money and go away and do something with it. So that is not possible in uh, this kind of a technology. Uh, to verify the transactions, every block, uh, they basically add the transactions to every block. So you can see that uh, transaction is being added. And these are the blocks. So that happens. And every block has a timestamp. It's not visible, though. But yeah. So uh, the transactions are linked to the previous uh, records. Like, uh, imagine this to be one of these blocks to be a transaction. Every transaction is always having a bit of information from the previous block. And when you go to the previous block, you can retrieve uh, which previous block that was linked to. So there is always a chain. And that is why it's called the block chain. Uh, when and if, if and case, let's say a person goes and changes a bit of uh, code in one of these uh, chains, what happens is a different change is created because the network detects that this is not a right, uh, cryptographically speaking, it is not a right change in code. The hashes vary, and the system is able to detect that uh, this transaction that is coming in is from a corrupted uh, Bitcoin node. And what would happen is the person, whoever has uh, actually done it, will can continue to actually uh, grow the blockchain database, which is a corrupted database. He can continue to grow it, but to actually catch up with the world, rest of the world's database, which is growing at 10 MB per uh, uh, minute as such, it becomes a huge uh, cost for the attacker himself, and which is li literally not feasible to any uh, present day situation. And the network is almost 20 times stronger than the top 500 uh, supercomputers combined in the world. So that is what the power of Bitcoin's uh, existing infrastructure is as on date. Uh, people decide uh, what they want to do with their computers, and people literally own the ecosystem. Uh, the vast majority of uh, network, only if the vast majority of the network agrees for the code change, only then people, uh, the network will actually change the code. Because you need to download the software and run it. If something is changing in the software, as long as uh, you download it and the whole network uh, comes to a, a mutual agreement that they want to run this software and they are fully in acceptance with the code changes that has been done for the benefit of the technology, only then things can be changed. Uh, yeah, uh, but we can always ask everything can be hacked, things can go wrong. Uh, but uh, to be very honest, this is an open uh, network and it's an invite kind of a thing for all the biggest attackers in the world. Every day, 50 million transactions happen on this network. And it's not like some hidden uh, bank or some kind of a database which is stored behind the security walls of a lot of companies. It's completely public. So it's like an open invitation. People are still trying to break into the network, but so far it's not been possible. Although entities which involve in Bitcoin-based solutions or uh, solution providers have been compromised. Mongox was one of the biggest examples for this. And in the Bitcoin network, what happens is, although attacker, let's say, imagine an attacker tries to hack some coin, uh, hack your accounts and get some Bitcoins out of your ecosystem or your wallets or your accounts, what would happen is it would still leave an immutable uh, trail behind. So every time a, a bit of uh, uh, coins moves from one place to another, it always leaves a continuous record. So it's basically pointless for an attacker to actually uh, hack into the network, steal your coins, and move it from one place to another. He will not be able to run away with it. There is always a record left behind, and makes it more difficult for criminals. Uh, yeah, there were like a lot of uh, skeptics who are not very much uh, supportive of Bitcoin, uh, cryptographers and security researchers as well, and including guys from the financial industry. But now things have changed. It has proven the testimony of time, and it is continuously growing. Uh, so what does all of this technical stuff mean for you guys? So it basically means you can send and receive money. That is what Bitcoin is all about. Uh, there is a huge thing that financial innovations held, uh, held back due to uh, rules and regulations. But in Bitcoin's world or the blockchain world as such, it's completely based on open source technology. And anyone is always free to uh, contribute to it. Ever since the start of Bitcoin uh, a technology, uh, the code was open source. The number of uh, commits have been done to the GitHub and other uh, platforms as well. There are a lot of spin-offs of uh, Bitcoin technology, which became like the blockchain technology. And today, blockchain technology is one of the even bigger uh, looked into sectors. Uh, it's the same force driving uh, the internet innovation. 
we live in the internet era so there's been a lot of innovation like facebook google or whichever company you name it this is all the information uh, uh, innovations that are go that have happened over the past few years. Uh, now we are going to see uh, innovations happening in the blockchain-based uh, system, where is, which is the innovation for financial and digital assets, uh, storage and stuff like that, record management, etc. And money is just the tip of the iceberg. The Bitcoin in itself, the technology, is just one of the flavors of the underneath blockchain technology, and it holds a lot more to this uh, technology. And there is going to be a lot more. Uh, developments that will going to happen in the coming years. Uh, blockchain could literally disrupt everything. Uh, like I said, internet again the era from text to images to programs to HD videos. Uh, similarly, blockchain has just started off with money and smart contracts, and there is patents and assets and a lot more is going to get added. Uh, now talking about blockchain again, there's a lot of confusion about different types of blockchains. So there are basically like a lot of types like. Uh, uh, permission blockchain, private blockchains, public blockchains, and all of this jargons. So, uh, uh, what does uh, this imply for uh, developers? So, uh, as a developer, you would require to secure your uh, uh, data in your applications, uh, decentralize your users' data to, uh, in order to ensure that your users' data is better protected and it is never compromised in case your app got hacked or let's say there was some exploit in your app. And also learn more about uh, blockchain and decentralized technologies. Uh, write smart contracts. Smart contracts basically enable you to put your code on a completely decentralized network. It's like you don't have to run your own servers. You can use all of the network that's already existing and just put your code in the network and it always stays there. Uh, rethink the ownerships of your identity, ownerships of your customers. Uh, defining, again, uh, like I said, a public blockchain, enterprise blockchain, and there is this thing called hybrid blockchains. In a public blockchain, what happens is uh, the entire blockchain data is public. Anyone can audit it, anyone can access it, anyone can write to it, uh, anyone can transact within the uh, public blockchain. In an enterprise blockchain, what would happen is only trusted entities, let's say if I'm IBM, only people that IBM gives access to this blockchain, although it's the same technology, but only people with authorized access to connect to the network will be able to use it. Uh, again, like uh, the inter inter internet, intranet uh, thing, concept here, uh, so public blockchains basically become the internet and enterprise blockchains become more like the internet uh, in the blockchain world. Uh, private blockchains are more like uh, a Dropbox being built on uh, the internet itself. Uh, although both uh, will have their own use cases and benefits, uh, in the longer run, uh, the public blockchain is the one which will create the most value because uh, as long as it is transparent and other people are able to audit it, it brings in a lot more uh, trust and uh, it's more secure because there's a lot more uh, people who can basically uh, contribute to the network. Uh, blockchain again can be classified, uh, there are different uh, layers, there's a platform layer and the software layer. Platform basically are like public platforms like Ethereum and Bitcoin. These are the most uh, widely popularized uh, platforms of the, the blockchain technology. Uh, and the software platforms like Hyperledger and uh, Eris and Digital Assets, which are basically like uh, companies providing software solutions for developers and other people, enterprise uh, guys to build on uh, it. Uh, again, the same thing. So uh, Terian is basically one of the data verification uh, applications built on top of blockchain network. You can basically put your data on the Bitcoin blockchain network and verify that the data was uh, uploaded at X time and stuff. Uh, the hash of the file can be saved. And Everledger is an uh, Ethereum-based application which is built basically to prevent uh, fraud in the diamond industry. And it is being uh, uh, used uh, pretty much widely in the current day scenarios. Uh, software development platforms uh, and uh, Hyperledger, Ripple, like there are some APIs and stuff. So multi-chain is one of like uh, uh, recently uh, come out platform. It's kind of like similar to Ethereum, uh, but it's more like a private uh, enterprise solution. Uh, now Hyperledger uh, model, what happens is there is a permission issuer. As you can see, like everything else is same, pretty much similar to the Bitcoin network. There are peers and there is uh, validating entities which connect to the network and verify that the transaction has happened. But the only difference what ha in this situation is there is a permission issuer. And the issuer basically creates a contract and defines the set of rules. He defines that what are the rules that can happen within the organization if, let's say, X individual can transfer only this much amount of money within this much period of time. There are a set of rules. And it's a permission blockchain. And what happens is people basically set the limits. 
and the end user can always use it in a similar fashion like the public blockchain but the permission the entity with the permission is always free to go back and edit or make changes at his will uh, smart contracts again you have a contract and with ethereum's uh, uh, thing that is the solidity language that is built basically to program smart contracts it becomes a smart contract so that's the difference from a, a regular contract to a smart contract powered by ethereum this is basically a code for which is basically in solidity solidity like i said is the language for smart contracts and let's say there's a conference app d app is a decentralized application built using solidity uh, to buy tickets or refund a ticket everything can be built uh, within few matter of uh, few minute of seconds uh, and there are a lot of uh, applications being built like d apps it's a decentralized application there is a flight delay insurance as well so in case if your flight is delayed you basically let's say if you are using this technology and you pay for a flight and let's say if your flight is delayed you are always free to ask for a refund or cancellation or immediate refund and settlements can be made instantaneously because uh, the apis will already have the data if the flight is delayed or not and so on and so forth and there are a lot of applications this is like what just one of the few of the applications you can always visit this website it's like a lot of applications that are already there built on the ethereum blockchain uh applications again uh, digital currency smart contracts securities uh, and record keeping uh, like a lot of sectors where uh, bitcoin's blockchain or the blockchain technology in itself can be implemented and it's being already used uh financial use cases like i said uh, there are currency exchanges like coin secure or other companies like bitstamp uh, bitpay etc so they allow people to exchange uh, good volumes of bitcoin and the peer to peer transfers there is payroll and insurance as well so payrolls in, let's say imagine a use case with international payrolls for example recently uh, airbnb and uber recently partnered with a payroll company bitwage now uh, most of the guys in india can start accepting uh, their uh, earnings let's say from foreigners or other player airbnb is mostly like for international audience uh they can accept their payments in bitcoin so it's like a payroll kind of a, or a uh settlement kind of a system and there are also compliance companies that are uh, spinning off from the financial use case a uh, companies are able to verify if a person's identity or let's say if a person has x amount of value and based on that they can uh, issue a bigger volume insurance uh, cover policy and stuff like that uh gaming industry also has a, like a huge platform with gaming what happens is let's say if you are a user of uh crush candy or any kind of facebook driven applications once you put in the money there is no way to get the money out it's a closed loop system basically you spend a lot of money on facebook application or any other uh, gaming multiplayer gaming application and you earn a lot of money you are like a hardcore gamer uh, although they have like options to in incentivize the gamer you are not able to instantaneously uh use it it's like you have either have to go for a opt for a gift coupon or something like that uh, with bitcoins uh, technology being implemented or the blockchain technology being implemented uh, there can be seamless cryptocurrencies which can be built for every individual game and conversion from or uh, transfer from one digital currency to another digital currency becomes really easy and seamless uh non financial use cases i mean there is a lot of uh, documents record storage uh, auth authenticity authenticity and authorization uh, platforms uh, digital identity like uh, kyc and also aadhar if aadhar were to implement blockchain it would be a huge uh, a boon for uh, india and marketplaces smart contracts again real estate now there are a lot of countries which have come forward and decided to map all of the uh, uh, properties that an individual owns on the blockchain network for internal as well as public auditing so it becomes really easy for governance uh diamonds like i said avalanche is already working on that sector uh, iot as well with machines uh, machines doing uh, payments within each other let's say if your fridge or any other uh, appliance wants to make a payment within uh, itself within the network now what happens is if you build a technology let's say as a developer if you are building a technology here and if you want the same technology to work in us here you are linked with sbi and if you go to us the technology you will have to link it with another bank in the us it becomes like a, another challenge you need to spend a lot of time in development as well but with bitcoin as a uh, or a blockchain based uh, solution for uh, machine based payments uh, it becomes seamless and it can be like instantly done uh mit labs uh, there is like certificates being issued on the blockchain network uh, slockit basically is a, a smart lock built on top of the ethereum uh, 
contract. So basically, you can decide uh, if only if and only when the guest basically or the uh, person pays for it, the door opens. Otherwise, the door doesn't open. So the person never gets access to the house for the rent or its other purposes. Uh, healthcare as well. There's a lot of uh, scope that's uh, gone into healthcare. Uh, Philips has invested hugely in a healthcare company, and MedRecords is a MIT project again used for uh, enterprise uh, medical record management. 16% uh, of healthcare companies are already in this year, 2017, as per IBM's uh, records, as per IBM's recent white paper. 16% uh, of uh, biggest healthcare companies are already working on blockchain technology and will be rolling out with uh, uh, working uh, solutions this year. Uh, Estonia is one country where basically they have gone step one step forward than any other uh, countries in the world. They have basically taken one million citizen healthcare records on the blockchain uh, network via one of our blockchain technology partners. So this is something that's really uh, good. And this picture basically symbolizes that all, there is doctor and let's say the person is connected to the blockchain network. Uh, me as an individual will become a living key for my data. It can be like uh, my sensors or my health heart rate partner patterns that can be studied, my retina scan, my eye, uh, fingerprint scan, all together. Because fingerprint again is not a, it's a point of failure again. There are chances where fingerprints have been leaked again and there's a lot of possibilities. Uh, so you as an individual, the whole pattern is studied and you become a living key. There can be like bionic implants as well uh, within you. Uh, chips can be implanted and stuff can be done. Uh, in, again, health clinical data processing claims, like if a person dies, insurance can be like, uh, the claims can be instantaneously issued. You don't have to wait for any entity to sit and approve it. Uh, pharmaceutical supply chain. Supply chains is a huge industry. Again, there is a lot of uh, fake drugs in the market. If blockchain technology were to be implemented, anyone, let's say uh, I'm a foreigner and I come to India and I go and try to buy a uh, medicine from a pharmacy shop, uh, what happens is I, I basically get the drug, but I don't have any, I don't know what are the standards being practiced here and uh, how do I verify that this drug was actually manufactured in an authorized uh, center, right? To do that, uh, if the information was put on the blockchain network, like uh, the whole supply chain from where the uh, supply came for the industry and uh, from where uh, the drug was manufactured and from which center, which distribution center it's moved and finally it comes to the uh, chemist shop at your nearby place, right? So all of that can be verified. Uh, there is a huge shortage of developers for the blockchain industry. Uh, as of now, there are only just 5,000 uh, hardcore committed uh, developers working on this technology and estimated another 20,000 developers who are like uh, working uh, in and out with uh, not full amount of dedication to this technology. Uh, yeah, that's it. I mean, any questions? I have a quick demo. Like if you have time, you can actually show a smart contract demo. You can? Yeah. Oh, uh, is that laptop going to turn on? Questions in the meanwhile? Questions, what, what raise their hands? I think Anupam and, yeah. Oh, one second. Let's just switch it like, from this to that. Just, no, switch it oh. off. Don't connect this one. This is not my laptop. Okay. Is it charged now? No. Yeah. Oh. Oh, great. Hi. Uh, hi, Amazon. Can we encash yeah. uh, Sorry, I'm Sanjana. Uh, can we encash bitcoins or is it just in the network? Uh, I didn't get your question. Can Please. we encash bitcoins? Huh? Can we? Yeah, that's where CoinSecure comes in. CoinSecure are other exchangers as such which are there in the ecosystem. We enable users to get on the Bitcoin network because not everyone in the network can mine Bitcoins. That's, like I said, it's actually comparable to gold. Uh, now, not everyone in the world goes and mines their own gold, right? You can't mine gold. There is a, you, there's a lot of uh, resources that needs to be put in and you need to go really deep into the earth to get that gold out. So it's a, in a similar fashion, there are this group of miners which actually uh, contribute to the infrastructure and build the whole uh, mining ecosystem for Bitcoin. That is where Bitcoins are generated. That is how Bitcoins, the 21 million Bitcoins which are in existence, like I said, already 16 million Bitcoins have already been mined. 
Now, where did these bitcoins come from? It was based on math, and every time a miner or some amount of computing power is contributed, they are rewarded with X amount of bitcoins. And miners are free to uh, sell their bitcoins and uh, get some profit out of it. Uh, and individuals like me or you, if they want to use Bitcoin, they come to exchange or other kind of platforms, or you can offer uh, your services. Let's say I'm a developer, I can always charge my uh, clients in Bitcoin. That is one way to actually acquire Bitcoin. Here, here. Yeah. No, just here, here one question. Uh, no, no, here, 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 here. here. Hi, my name is Anupam from the Takshila Institution. Yeah. Uh, I just want to ask about the the one MB block size limits. Yeah. And is that a real um, uh, uh, is that it's a, real a huge threat? debatable topic? To be honest, let me just explain. To uh, so there is uh, there is a lot of there is different groups of people uh, saying that uh, one MB limit is not sufficient because the amount of transactions that are going into the network is uh, getting higher day by day because a lot of people are getting onto the network now because of its huge potential. Now the challenge is, uh, with the limit 1 MB was basically set, keeping in mind that Bitcoin should be decentralized. Yeah. In the essence, what it means is, every individual, be it a person living in India with a 512 kbps internet speed, or even lower, should be able to connect to the network and download the data. 1 MB limit was initially kept so that every individual, no matter what his internet speeds are, is able to download the data. And there was a lot of debate and uh, finally developers agreed to double to 2, it MB. To 2 MB for now. Yeah. For the time being, again it's a, a situation, for the time being it's been increased to 2 MB. And uh, with the current evolution of the internet in itself, from what speeds that we grew up with, uh, let's say uh, five, uh, 20, 56 kbps to the current uh, 100 gbps, mbps that we live in, uh, it's a, just a matter of time by when uh, this kind of high speed internet will actually reach, especially Geo. Big thanks to them for making that <laughs> internet uh, speed just go wild in India. So, yeah, with this so, kind of things, it So, you don't like, see a scalability issue at all? Uh, personally, I don't think it will be a problem. It's just a matter of uh, internet infrastructure in itself growing, and Bitcoin can always, the network in itself can always be improvised. Uh, what I do see is uh, in case Bitcoin's uh, network is becoming too crowded, uh, what would happen is. Uh, developers will change some code in the Bitcoin network and if all of the community agrees, everyone decides to switch to the newer code, uh, there will be like a much more better database storage mechanism, the storage mechanism, it might be optimized. Uh, if it doesn't work out, what would happen is there will be like smaller coins like Litecoin and other altcoins, there are so many coins these days, Ethereum also is, a big, is become a coin now. Uh, so all of these other coins will be used for smaller transactions. But because they are underneath using the same cryptocurrency technology, transferring from one coin to another coin becomes seamless. So you just run a website or uh, let's say a, a piece of smart contract on the Ethereum network that basically says I want to transfer, I transfer bitcoins to this specific account and you just convert it to Ethereum and send me Ethereum coins. And nobody comes in between, there is no third party that you need to uh, that has to look after this, it's just a smart contract, it's computer and everything, the coins itself are digital, so it becomes like seamless uh, conversion. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I've had a question there. Yeah, yeah you have mentioned that peer-to-peer uh, -peer transaction. Yeah. It, it can be applicable to cash, share transaction, anything, uh, using the blockchain technology, right? For cash, yeah. For uh, cash transactions, you can't really, because it's a physical thing, but uh, let's say, uh, I decide to take cash, like the, this person, basically, one of the this ladies basically asked me, uh, how do you uh, convert exchange bitcoins for cash? No, uh, what I'm so, asking is, yeah. uh, there, is an, there is no intermediary when you uh, transact from peer to peer, right? There's no intermediary between the peer to peer transaction, right? I mean, it's is like that? cash, right? When you're using yeah. cash, there's no intermediary. If uh, Are you asking like, yeah. if cash can be put on Bitcoin network or are, are uh, you like blockchain, asking? Blockchain technology, the cash can be put into blockchain technology. Is there a possibility? Uh, if all of the nodes, like the widely uh, popularized uh, uh, thing that happened, that every node has a satellite trackable chip or any other kind of a scenario where each of the nodes that are being uh, printed by the RBI or any other uh, uh, financial institution, what they can do is, let's say if every uh, note had a secure hash that was printed and it ensured that an equal amount of value was, a digital 
a copy of that was created and maintained in the blockchain uh, ecosystem, uh, nodes can easily, easily be tracked. So what it basically means is, now in the current day scenario, what would happen is, uh, one node can be faked into another node. A replica of the node can be made. Now, how will you know uh, if this node is fake or not? You go to a bank and uh, then later on it gets detected. Otherwise, you use a node scanning uh, instrument, which again can be like uh, prone to flaws. Now, if the same uh, note, uh, a hash was implemented and the hash was actually printed on the note or in a secure manner or in an encrypted manner, uh, what would happen is uh, any individual in any part of the world can always have a mobile application which is connected to the blockchain network and just scan the hash and verify if this note is actually legitimate or not. So that's a possibility. Uh, I yeah. have a slightly more basic question. Yeah. Can I today I have a stack of notes? Can I buy like Bitcoin through such notes, such currency through such you, notes? You mean like buying Bitcoins with cash? Yes. Uh, as of now in India, most of the uh, companies like CoinSecure or other players which are there in the market, Zeppe, UnoCoin and most of the other uh, companies in India which uh, enable Indian users to get on board Bitcoin technology, uh, they don't do any transactions in cash. Okay. So it's a completely, there was a, a report by uh, India today or something that uh, companies in India are doing uh, Bitcoin and uh, cash and a lot of money laundering and stuff is happening in the Bitcoin network. Uh, in two essence, sense, I would like to clarify this. What would happen, uh, in, at least in India or other parts of the places, most of the companies or people like exchanges, Bitcoin are always uh, transacted from bank accounts. People buy it in digital forms and uh, every record is tracked. So eventually you would know where the Bitcoins are coming from and who is buying them and where it is going. So there is always a record that's being stored. So it becomes more difficult if you do any kind of those activities and try to get away with it. Oh, yeah. oh better question back there. Yeah, Pranesh. Uh, if any of you are interested to actually see a smart contract demo, I'll be like uh, Let, available. Let's just finish the yeah. questions and then we can get into yeah. the demo. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, Hello, this is Pranish from CIS. Yeah, Pranish. Um, I was just wondering about uh, the fact that you multiple times during your presentation mentioned that Bitcoin transactions are instantaneous. Yeah. But uh, from what I had previously understood, uh, there needs to be a, a settlement process which can, uh, which is not real time because okay. that actually I, I needs... will I will clarify on that bit. Uh, now, what happens is when a Bitcoin transaction actually happens, the transactions are immediately pushed on the Bitcoin network, right? Whenever if you are, as soon as you are connected to the network, a transaction is pushed. Now, the complexity, uh, be, because of the limits, like the 1 MB limits that's being imposed and the amount of transactions that are being added on the network, there is a delay in all of the other nodes to actually verify or solve this cryptographic problem which basically is the security factor of Bitcoin to actually solve it and ensure that the transaction is 100% legitimate, verify it. And by the time it propagates to all of these uh, thousands of nodes all over in the world, uh, different number of confirmations are required. Uh, and that is where the time comes. But, but if you are a, a hardcore Bitcoin person who knows the technology in and out, uh, or let's say as soon as you push the transaction, Although there it shows that it's not been verified by anyone in the world, uh, you can rest assured that your transaction is 100% secure and the money has actually moved from point A to point B because it's visible already in the Bitcoin world. And uh, it becomes like, it's just a matter of time that when it propagates to the network and others, other nodes basically verify it. So with uh, the scaling issues that are currently being faced in the Bitcoin world, uh, eventually we'll be able to make it much more faster. Or you can always use a faster coin like Ethereum, which I said, which is not much crowded. So what you can do is for instantaneous uh, conversions until the point when Bitcoin actually fixes that issue. Uh, it's not an issue, it's because of scalability issue, right? So what happens is you can use a smaller coin, which can be like used uh, altcoin, which can do much faster transactions for smaller volumes. And the bigger volumes can always be done on the main uh, Bitcoin network. And also, uh, there is a thing called uh, miners fee. Now, uh, imagine uh, all of these companies which are mining gold, right? Uh, if they are pumping in a lot of money, and let's say you want X, uh, you want to like get X amount of gold, you can uh, today. Excuse <coughs> me. If you want to get X amount of gold today, you can always pay an additional fee and tell them just deliver the gold today. And similarly, in a Bitcoin network, the miners fee basically decides how fast your uh, transaction propagates through the network. If you put a higher fee, it's, it's not mandatory, 
uh, Bitcoin's network allows you to put a fee which is as minimal as one pesa, even for a billion or trillion dollar transaction. Now, this is the beauty of it. No matter what the value that you are moving from one part to uh, one account to another, the fee can be one pesa or less than a pesa. It's the same technology. It's just a matter of time that by when your transaction will be completed, when it will be verified, when it will be propagating to the network. Let's say if I decide I, I'm doing a, a $2 billion uh, transaction and uh, I don't want to wait that much time. I want it to like get verified within five minutes or within like one second. I just decide to increase my mining fee. I can like do something like maybe 100 rupees or let's say in current day scenario to do an instantaneous uh, propagation within the network. Uh, you would require to pay something like 50 to 100 bucks and if you are paying 50 to 100 bucks, your transaction will instantaneously get verified because miners pick these transactions faster because there is a reward for the miners. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yep. Yeah. So Does that answer the question, Pranesh? Yeah. Um, I had more, but I'll follow up with you okay. later. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, qu uh, qu a second. There's a question here. One second. One second. Oh, this uh, mic's coming. Yeah. There's also a question. So if I understand it correctly, then with Bitcoin, even if you put a very high reward on your transaction, you still need to wait for at least the next block to be mined, right? So even if you put a very high transaction fee, you still need to wait on average 10 minutes, right? Yeah, which is still fast. And, and the beauty of this is once your Bitcoin uh, transaction gets even one verification, Bitcoin's network, you are allowed to spend it. As soon as you get one, you don't need to require for the uh, 100 or 1000 verifications like for all the nodes in the world to verify your transaction. Uh, if just one or two uh, nodes verify your transaction, they basically solve the problem and say this transaction is a 100% legitimate transaction, uh, you are immediately allowed to transfer those bitcoins again. It's not like in your bank what happens is if money is being sent from one part of the world to another part of the world, it takes one or two days and you need to wait and only then after you get the money finally, although you get a confirmation, let's say PayPal, right? You get a confirmation that the money has come in your account, but you need to wait for a day or two or three for PayPal to actually transfer the money to your Indian bank account. You can't really like use it until that point. With Bitcoin, what happens is uh, the transaction, as soon as it is made, and as soon as just one or two confirmations are done on the network, you can immediately transfer it to somewhere else and clear your payments or bills. We have one question from Twitter, so I'm going to ask yeah. Kiran to just ask it. Hello, I seem to have lost this. Is this mic? Yeah, it's on. It's on. It's on? Okay. So, someone is asking on Twitter, will blockchain remove middlemen and develop platforms that are not owned by corporates? Yes. Totally. Uh, it's already happening. That, that the trend has already started. Uh, there was a slide. I kind of like removed that slide. So uh, it, it basically meant uh, all of these uh, banks and stuff that investing hugely in private blockchains. Uh, but uh, what I see personally, or from a technology perspective, as the trend is going, I mentioned somewhere about uh, public blockchains, enterprise blockchains, and a middle uh, thing in between that. It's called the hybrid blockchains. Now what happens is. Banks will basically continue, like uh, Axis Bank is already uh, using Ripple for its internal transactions. They have just started off with a pilot. So uh, internally, they can continue to use a cryptocurrency based uh, technology. They just need to change the whole database system and map INR to some digital currency. And banks will continue to use a blockchain based uh, solution within the enterprise. Uh, now outside the enterprise, uh, if they want to ensure that, uh, let's say I'm a bank and I want to ensure to my customers but all the transactions that are happening in my bank, or let's say a government body as such, I want to ensure that all of these transactions are legitimate, it's not being changed or it's not being tampered. What I can do is, uh, every time uh, the blockchain, the bank's blockchain uh, grows, let's say there is a sector that grows, every new block and it is added, there is a ha unique hash created for that specific block, which is timestamped. Now this hash can be put on the public blockchain. Now, uh, please try to follow. What would happen is, although your uh, database is private, you're taking a cryptographic hash, uh, checksum hash or anything like that, for that particular uh, file, which is added in the bank, or let's say for an entire day, you take a whole database together, the blockchain database, and make a hash, generate a hash for that particular day uh, as a whole, and you can always push this hash on the Bitcoin's public blockchain. Now, from an outsider perspective, you will never know what all transactions happened within a bank or the enterprise. 
But if audits were to be done, and if you want to, let's say, if there was a hack or something went wrong, or the government wanted to kind of like verify what all kind of transactions have happened, uh, the bank and uh, the company which is using a uh, private blockchain can always, using the services of a hybrid uh, blockchain solution, can say that uh, for this particular day, all the transactions, we have generated a hash and it is stored on the public blockchain. You can always verify and we can be 100%, we can, they can prove that none of the transactions that happened on the day were changed or manipulated in any way. Because the hash is already put on the blockchain, uh, public blockchain, and it is timestamped. So you clearly have a 100% uh, audit trail. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there are no further, oh sorry, there's one last question. Yeah. And uh, then we can play the footage. <laughs> Uh, hi Vivek. Yeah. Um, so really nice talk. Um, uh, th there were a few questions asked uh, in this uh, round of questions, uh, and I wanted a, a little clarification. Yeah. So your question was, uh, can we buy Bitcoin with cash? The answer is yes, but Vivek is correct on the standpoint that there are no companies, registered companies in India, which are uh, selling Bitcoin for cash. But I have Bitcoins, and you can buy them for cash. Uh, it's it's more like a commodity per se. So you can buy gold with cash. You can buy any other uh, thing. With, it's completely butter. It's like it's it's a free uh, thing. You can always exchange uh, uh, bitcoins for cash as an individual or a peer-to-peer -peer based model. But in terms of companies and enterprises uh, which are out there in the market, uh, currently they don't. So Great. yeah. Uh, second thing, uh, time taken for a transaction. So it's instantaneous, as Vivek said, said uh, the transactions are instantaneous that you would know that transaction is happening. But uh, a 10 minutes of a waiting time is there for you to be certain that the tra transaction is verified. And after every 10 minutes, you are just more certain that the transaction has happened. Uh, but again, it's never 100% certainty uh, that the transaction has happened. Vivek, please correct me if I'm wrong here. Uh, see, from a Bitcoin, uh, like I said, from a technological standpoint, I know that I have the keys for the Bitcoin. Let's say if I own the Bitcoin wallet, if I'm running my own Bitcoin software on my laptop, which is synced 100% to the network, let's say the whole 65 GB, as of date, it's about 65 GB, the Bitcoin's blockchain. If the whole database is on my system, and I as an open source guy who's able to actually dig into the details and see, uh, now if I have my key and I push a transaction to the network, I can be rest assured that no one else in the world has this key, and once the transaction is broadcasted, I can peacefully uh, rest assured by the principles of MACD and the cryptographic algorithm that is in place that uh, the transaction will happen. Although it might take time, but I can be rest assured. For a common man, uh, it is a bit of a concern. So when they are using uh, third party providers, like third party wallets or other kind of service providers, so what these providers basically do is they implement some kind of a, a speed up mechanism. So what it basically means is, uh, as soon as a transaction is done, right? If the fee, a sufficient amount, these companies basically add a suitable amount of fee. Uh, there are different ways, there are calculators available online, uh, uh, different websites are there, which basically calculate the amount of fees that were uh, put already on the blockchain network, because the records are anyways public. You can study how much amount of fees are being put currently and how many pending transactions are there. If uh, in today's world, what is happening is in the Bitcoin's network, uh, at a given point of time, a normal uh, day, the, about 4,000 to 5,000 transactions are unconfirmed for every block. There are about 4,000 to 5,000 transactions being queued up to be added to the next block. But in times of like uh, price speculations or if the prices go up and down, when people actually move a lot of Bitcoins, we have seen transactions going up to 40,000, 50,000, 60,000 for a short amount of time. And at that point of time, the network gets clogged and you literally have to wait maybe even if you put a small fees, right? Let's say like one paisa or something like even less than that, you would have to wait for uh, at least two days. Depends. If you like put a really small fee, sometimes what happens is the transaction doesn't go through, but it will take its own time, but it will get verified. The trust is always there, but it will get verified. Okay, okay, so my question was... Oh, no, no, sorry, I think yeah. we'll have to move on to the next we uh, talk. Yeah. We can discuss this later. So I'll call upon Florian. Please give a round of applause to Vivek. Thank you, guys.